So as some of you may know, uh, in spring this year, the Pirate Party of Iceland appointed me to the supervisory board of the Atlantic Central Bank. And as a consequence, I have to say that I'm speaking today as a private citizen, and nothing I say should be in any way interpreted as being uh, the opinion of either the central bank or its supervisory committee. So we all tend to take loans for granted. We never look at the small print. Uh, pick out an apartment, go into a bank, ask nicely, sign on the dotted line, and hopefully live happily ever after. Do that in Iceland, and you could be making a terrible mistake that will haunt you financially for the rest of your life. And the reason for that is that a very common form of loan in Iceland is called Vestriklan, a negatively amortized index-linked loan. And when Icelanders talk about these loans, they typically say nobody will ever believe how crazy they are, and I have to agree with them about that. If you know anything at all about finance, then the words negatively amortized are probably already ringing some alarm bells. Index-linked loans are loans that are structured so that at any rate of inflation above about 2 to 3 percent, the amount of interest that you're paying uh, is linked to the rate of inflation. And this extra amount is added to the loan capital, the amount you owe. So instead of shrinking, like it does with every form of loan used everywhere else in the world, the amount you owe actually grows over time. And the result of this is that the amount you have to pay uh, also grows over time. Now, as I said, anywhere else in the world, a negatively amortized loan is rightly regarded as a very risky, uh, very dangerous way to borrow. And typically, they're supposed to only be for sophisticated investors. And sophisticated investor is a code word in the financial industry that typically means sucker. <laughs> Here in Iceland, for over 20 years, they were government policy. Now, you may be wondering how any country gets itself into a situation where they're making negatively amortized loans the only form of lending that anyone can take out. And to understand that, we actually have to go back over 45 years now to the breakup of the post-war financial regulatory structure, the Bretton Woods scheme, to which Iceland was a signatory member, uh, which broke up essentially under the weight of its own contradictions in the 1970s. Most countries during this period experience a very high rate of inflation, but ultimately they recover from it. Unfortunately, here in Iceland, the government makes the mistake of printing money into an unregulated banking system. And the result of that is Iceland's first hyperinflation. Now, hyperinflation, as Venezuela unfortunately is currently finding out, is one of the most destructive forces you can unleash on any society. The rapid increase in the money supply and the corresponding rapid increase in prices very quickly breaks apart the invisible network of financial relationships that is essentially holding the economy together. And most countries don't survive a hyperinflation either economically or socially. Iceland, to its great credit, has actually managed to do this twice. And the reason for that is that Iceland is actually a very strong uh, democracy. And as a democracy, it comes together in emergencies as a single society and tries to solve problems together. And so with the first high pre-inflation, when the prices really started to escalate, a number of seemingly commonsensical measures were taken in order to try to tackle the problem. First of all, wages were linked to inflation so that people could afford to buy things like food. Uh, then an attempt was made to control prices. This actually never works uh, if you're trying this with uh, hyperinflation, but you can't blame people for trying. Uh, and then as the krona was rapidly depreciating, uh, Iceland successfully resorted to uh, barter internationally to trade, and that resulted in a country becoming addicted to Polish chocolate. And finally, at the end of this process, uh, the decision was made to link loans to inflation. Uh, 
And this also was for seemingly sensible reasons, because loans aren't just being made by evil bankers, they're also being made by people like pension funds and housing corporations and student loans, who need that money in order to pay their pension obligations and make new loans for students. And they were losing the value of their loans, and something had to be done to equalize things for them. Because the problem ultimately with hyperinflation is it doesn't take too many years of it before anyone can just take their monthly salary, walk into the bank, and pay off their entire loan there and then. And the problem at some level isn't the argument itself. The problem is what happens in the banking system if you index loans to inflation. And what it does is it essentially causes a feedback loop. Now, I got interested in this because, as a computer scientist, I built a simulation of the banking system. And when I started looking into how all of this worked, I found something very disturbing about these loans. And essentially, what they're doing is creating a feedback loop embedded in the very core of the financial system here in Iceland. Now, feedback loops are fun if you're an engineer, um, but we don't typically recommend that they're used for critical systems, especially not like the banking system. Uh, a feedback loop is essentially when some sort of real-time process feeds back on itself continuously. So, for example, if you start heating the Earth's climate, you melt the North Pole, uh, there's less ice there, the heat that's reaching the Earth uh, more of it is absorbed by the Earth, and less of it is reflected back into space, so the Earth heats up even faster. And as this goes round and round, well, Iceland is getting noticeably warmer in the summer, Canada is probably also enjoying the heat, and Florida is going to end up having to be evacuated. That's the feedback loop. And the way index-linked loans work, well, the question is, what exactly happens in the banking system if you link loans to inflation? Well, banking systems create money. Uh, I think most people understand that now. What, and people get a bit hot under the collar about this. But uh, what they tend to miss out is that when you repay a loan, uh, that money is actually destroyed, and also if a loan has to be written off. So most well-regulated banking systems actually exist in this state of slow and fairly steady expansion, and that's probably, in balance, fairly good for the economy. But what happens if you link the capital of an existing loan to inflation, and that you allow that to increase? Well, what happens in the Icelandic banking system is there's a matching increase in the money supply, that money is recognized by the banks as profits. It's paid out to their employees or to dividend holders as dividends. Uh, and that actually increases the money supply, that increases inflation. So these loans that are linked to inflation themselves cause additional inflation. Uh, and that's a huge problem. Uh, now, if you talk to Icelandic economists about these loans, they typically credit them with being the thing that ended the first hyperinflation. There isn't actually any evidence for that. Uh, if you look at the monetary figures, what you see is that uh, the money supply continued to increase several years after these loans were introduced. Uh, eventually, the government stopped printing money. Slowly after that, the banking system started to stabilize. There were some additional feedback loops that had been introduced by linking in salaries to prices. Uh, and eventually, as the system was starting to uh, slow down, everybody sat down in the national wage uh, agreement and agreed to decouple, uh, pri basically, prices and salaries. And inflation very rapidly dropped after that, and the system stabilized at the beginning of the 90s. One of the consequences of that is your personal experience of these loans depends very much on when you took them out. Take one out in the 80s, and you may well never pay it back, but at least your salary was directly indexed to inflation, so you could keep up with payments. Take one out in the 90s, a period of relatively low inflation here, and a very stable system, and although these loans are very expensive relative to their equivalent compound interest rate loans in Europe or in America, uh, you could still probably keep ahead and pay back the loan appropriately. Take one out in the 2000s, after the banking system was deregulated, and the second hyperinflation occurs between 2006 to 2008, 
And the resulting increase in the capital uh, has pretty much wiped out financially most of the Icelandic households with these loans. In fact, most of the people with loans from that period have either defaulted on them and over 10,000 households were foreclosed on here uh, as a result of the 2008 crash, or they're in this zombie-like status of having to be forced to pay as much as they can every month by the bank, but with no real prospect of ever fully repaying the loan. That's bad enough. But one of the other consequences of the deregulation in 2000 was that compound interest rate loans also became available. So now in Iceland, you have a choice. You can either take out an index-linked loan or you can take out a compound interest rate loan. All negatively amortized loans start off cheaper than their compound interest rate alternative because you're not paying enough interest uh, to cover the full amount that you should be paying. So that additional amount gets added to the capital. But it doesn't take very many years of repaying, uh, basically of that happening, before the resulting growth in the amount you owe overcomes the initial cheapness of the loan, and you end up paying considerably more than somebody who took out the compound interest rate loan did uh, in comparison. But the thing is, the compound interest rate loan starts off being more expensive. So what's happening at the moment is that if you're well paid, if you're well off, you can afford to take out a compound interest rate loan, and most people do. If you're not as well paid, you are forced to take out an index-linked loan, a much more expensive loan, uh, and one that you're at a huge disadvantage of right at the beginning. So we have a system, in some sense, where well-off, rich, well-paid people get cheap loans, and not-so-well-off people get very expensive loans, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But what this is essentially doing is creating a rapidly growing wealth gap, because the people with compound interest rate loans actually benefit from inflation. Their re loan repayments are constant, and as their salaries increase, the proportion of the loan gets cheaper. And people with index-linked loans, well, actually, those loans are causing additional inflation. Um, and we're talking about people like nurses, teachers, doctors, builders, the people on whom society depends, the bedrock of society, are being forced to take out these very risky, very dangerous loans. Because at the end of the day, Iceland can't control inflation. Lots of other things cause inflation. You know, if there's an oil crisis, if there's war in the Middle East, if there's a trade war, all of this can cause inflation, and it won't serve any economic purpose that these loans are linked to it and that the, uh, the payments are suddenly escalating. And I think we have to ask ourselves, is this really what we want? Because this isn't the 1970s anymore. We can control the system. We don't have to let it control us. Now, to individuals, the best advice I can give, I'm afraid, is don't take out one of these loans, or if you do have one, do everything you can to refinance it into a compound interest rate loan. Sell the car, walk to work, do everything you can to just afford a compound interest rate loan. The first few years of that will royally suck, I completely agree. You won't have a disposable income, right? But as salaries increase with inflation, uh, you will be ahead of the game much quicker than you could possibly realize, and very quickly, because your loan payment as a percentage of a salary is essentially reducing every year, you'll be ahead of the game, and hey, you'll be joining the new Icelandic upper class. As, you know, <laughs> that is the situation for everybody with a compound interest rate loan. For the 80% of households, of Icelandic households that currently have index-linked loans, that's not the case. Or, if you're young, uh, go abroad. <laughs> you, can get, you can get a 2 to 3% loan in America or Europe now uh, if you want to buy an apartment. Buy the apartment, pay the loan off quickly, come back and buy a house here with a compounded trade loan in cash. Um, that is terrible advice for any society to have to give its young people. 
Or we sit down as a community, as a society, and we finish the work that the National Wage Commission left undone 40 years ago. We basically find some kind of way to get these loans out of the economy, and probably a way that nobody will like, but ultimately one that everybody can live with. And we fix this problem before it becomes another macroeconomic disaster for Iceland. Because otherwise, due to essentially a mistake that was made 30, 40 years ago, we are all going to be trapped in this evolving and rapidly escalating wealth gap uh, that's being created by these loans. Now, as a computer scientist, I am required to have the professional humility to fix my mistakes in my software, to fix my bugs. And I would like to gently suggest that it is well overdue that we expect our economists to do the same. Thank you. <laughs>